My name is Bob Santelli. I work at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and welcome to the third annual American Music Master Series. Robert Johnson in the blue. He sings each song once, then sings it once again And each song comes from a hole inside where a soul once had been The records made the jukes all throughout the Southland The pretty women wondered, was he charmed or was he damned? Look over his shoulder Was there something there he feared? Turn your back for just one second The man disappeared A word came through St. Louis Up to Chicago All the way to New York City Where the blues just come and go Someone took his picture once And an angel stopped and cried In his eyes it was there to see He'd cross the other side Well in a bar on a warm spring night Was a man come through the door He had a bottle with a broken label And Robert seen his face before he said, this is my very best, drink it down, drink it slow Cause when I call your name again, you just pack up and go Was it some kind of trick, or did he jump the price? Or did he find a way in hell To sell his own soul twice Cause there's a cry in the wind tonight And only one man makes that sound Baby, grab your hat and coat Robert Johnson's back in town to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and just walking across the plaza and hearing his music coming out of the speakers, it sends a little chill up your spine, you know, because this is rather rarefied territory. There's a lot of millionaires and billionaires in this Hall of Fame. Robert Johnson wasn't one of them. In fact, he probably made less money than anybody else in this building during the time he was alive. But he sure left us a hell of a legacy, didn't he? I think it's just amazing that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is doing a program like this and uh, you, you know, we would have never imagined it. You know, I, I remember when uh, in the early issues of Living Blues magazine, uh, almost 30 years ago, we hired a police artist to draw a sketch of Robert Johnson based on descriptions of him because no one knew what he looked like. There had never been a, public, a picture published. And we've come a long way since then. You know, Rob, Robert Johnson is a million dollar industry into himself now. Got to get in my zone here. Yeah? i 
and down like me And the day keep me worried There's a hellhound on my trail Hellhound on my trail I can tell the wind is rising Leaves shaking on the tree Keep my company If the devil crippled me They'll crippled me And tomorrow I'll crippled day If the devil crippled me And tomorrow I'll crippled day My sweet rattle to pass the time away. Pass the time away. You sprinkle hot foot paddle all around your daddy door. You sprinkle hot foot paddle all around your daddy door. They leave me with a rambling mind right home Every old place I go Every place I go I got to keep moving Got to keep moving Blue falling down like begins with the Columbia reissue King of the Delta Blues Singers which came out in 1961 and that in effect said look, this is some music that nobody has really heard before but this is the music that provided the inspiration for people like Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters and that whole generation of Chicago blues singers and performers that was the principal inspiration on the English rockers who were coming to life in the 60s. Within the blues, Robert Johnson's probably not the most influential figure uh, on, you know, on other blues artists. But when you take it into the rock and roll realm, then you know he, it goes from Robert Johnson to Elmore James and Muddy Waters, from them to the Rolling Stones, from them on and on. So it just it just grown to enormous proportions. Now rediscovery, obviously is a very subjective term. For the person making the discovery, it may sometimes seem as if the object of study had never existed before. For the artist, for the individual being rediscovered, on the other hand, what does it mean? In some cases, a little more than, hey, I've been here all along. What took you so long to get here? I'd like to thank the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for uh, making sure that Robert and certain other artists, artists get recognized, man. It's, it's time. <laughs> Stick with it. Stick with it. Don't let up. Don't let up. my shoes you could tell I had me them old old walking blues I woke up this morning feel around round for my shoes you could tell right then that child boy, had the walking blues 
Some people say the word read, uh, oh, blues ain't bad. That's the word so feeling I most, I most ever had, Lord. Well, some people they say the, say the word, oh, blues ain't bad. Was so feeling that child, but I most ever had. Sometimes I feel like blowing all along some home. I woke up this morning, all I had was gone, Lord. Sometimes I feel like blowing my lonesome home. Woke up this morning. Every single thing I had was gone Sing about my girlfriend here. This she got everything moving from her head down, down to her toes. She could breaking on a dollar more than that. Whoa, where she go? She got everything moving from her head down, down to her toes. Breaking on a dollar now, child. Boy, and where she go? And if I had to, we'll ride the blinds. I've been mistreated, mommy, you know I don't mind dying. Yes, I'm leaving. If I had to, we'll ride the blinds. I've been mistreated, not ya, boy. And I don't mind dying. Obviously, we are the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. We have a, a rock and roll perspective to almost everything we do. But we're very concerned to show the diversity, to show how blues in general has impacted American music. The first generation to hear Robert Johnson would have been those who heard the Vocalion 78s in the 30s. But remember, when Johnson died in 1938, within a short period of time, half of his records of, of the 11 or 12 that were issued by that time were already out of print. But when King of the Delta Blues Singers is reissued on LP in 1961. Everything changes. For one thing, the music that Robert Johnson created in 1936 and 1937 on records is music that was just perfect for the audience that found it. They were listening to folk singers. They were listening essentially to acoustic guitar-driven music. And that's what Robert Johnson did. But the big thing is, and I think this is the thing that should never be underestimated, is the uh, lure of the cool. And the point is, the very fact that it wasn't known, and the fact that it had bubbled up from underneath, and the fact that it grew out in these sort of ripples, uh, uh, in this kind of ripple effect where all these people, I mean, everybody says, oh, they had to come over from England. Well, I don't think that's true. It came from many different directions, and it, came, and it was certainly kept alive as much in this country as it was in England. But it definitely came over also through the Rolling Stones, through uh, Eric Clapton, and everybody knew this was cool. This was the ultimate cool. And so, you, you know, you, everybody looks for that, that thing because it sort of saves a lot of time. The Robert Johnson right. box set was issued in 1990 and has sold so many copies since then and has obviously reached a very, you know, much wider audience than Johnson uh, had reached previously. Everybody who knows just a little bit about popular music or blues has heard the name Robert Johnson. But I think it's really been the myth of Robert Johnson that has had the influence on popular music as opposed to the recordings. Now the recordings themselves, the records, influence musicians. But I'm talking about general mainstream popular music culture. And I think there are a lot of people who are familiar with the stories, familiar with the mythology of Robert Johnson, but do not necessarily have an emotional relationship to the music like we all think we do have. Johnson is, as a figure certainly being enigmatic and uh, somewhat mysterious and almost cartoonish because we're so removed from his actual life. 
it, it allows people to romanticize it and and utilize that in whatever way, whether they want to do it visually or they want to do it in, in terms of sound. I'm Steve Levere. I'm the agent for the estate of Robert Johnson. And I became involved in this when I located Robert Johnson's sister, his half-sister living outside of Washington, D.C., back in 1973. Another researcher had found Johnson's sister a year before me, but he just didn't have the perception of the situation that I did. So I, it, when I met her, I said, look, I, I don't know if we've got anything here, but I've talked to an attorney and it looks like we we might have something with these old songs. Maybe we can indicate to the world that they're, they're not public domain. Columbia Records said they were, but that doesn't make it so necessarily. So why don't we try, you know, um, let's work together and see. I, I'll do the work, you've got the inheritance, let's join forces and see what the hell we got. What Steve Levere did was he finally caused to be published Robert Johnson's music. And once it was published and copywritten, all of a sudden you have royalty income coming in. And that's something that didn't exist until he did that. We contact the record companies and the artists, and we try and get people to acknowledge that Robert Johnson is the creator of the material that they're performing. It's not that people have made, not that blues artists have made a lot of money recording Robert Johnson stuff, it's that the rock and roll people have when Eric Clapton did Crossroads and when the Rolling Stones did Love and Vain. People who for years thought that Robert Johnson's music was in the public domain all of a sudden have to start paying for it. And this isn't the kind of thing that is necessarily uh, designed to make you a new friend in Steve Levere when he comes knocking at your door. But the fact of the matter is that he did it, it has been decreed to be legal, and so some of these people who have been copying Johnson's licks for years now have to pay up. Good idea in my estimation. The most well-known and primary person that we contacted was Eric Clapton. Eric, without, without hesitating, said absolutely, no problem, 
and he instructed his managers and his publishing companies and his, uh, all the people under his command to relinquish the material to King of Spades Music. And I'm proud to say that uh, I've never met Eric Clapton, but the man is a friend to Robert Johnson. Yeah, Robert Johnson's CDs and the rights to his material are, are, are bringing in lots of money now, and there's, there's been a, an ongoing battle about who's going to get the money. Um, there's a lot of relatives who have come forth. Uh, you know, it's an ongoing court battle down in Mississippi about that. I don't know what's going to happen with it. There is presently uh, in trust for the eventual heir uh, over a million two fifty, I believe it is now. Um, that's tax free. Taxes are all paid on that money. Anything in this world for me. I've got a kind hearted woman. Do anything in this world for me. Evil hearted women, well, they just won't leave me be. Nothing for me to tell you, but he lived with my mother about 10 years. And he would leave and stay gone two or three months and come back home with a pocket, all his pockets full of money and all that kind of thing. And he taught me how to play because I wasn't hard to teach. He showed me something today and tomorrow, I'd hand it right back to him. Yeah. I love my baby, but my baby don't love me. But my baby don't love me I really love that woman I can't stand to leave her be I, I didn't like, uh, you know, a lot of things he's done that I would, He drank a little kind of heavy I ain't never been no heavy drinker he seemed to control it pretty good, but he drank it pretty, pretty heavy. It ain't but the one thing that makes Mr. Johnson drink. I get worried about the way you treat me, and I begin to think, Oh, babe, my life don't seem the same. You really breaks my heart when you call me so-and-so name. I came in with Sonny Boy Williams, and we worked at one club here for about a year. And uh, the club owner got killed in a car accident. And Sonny Boy left and went to Detroit because of me. And that means that I had, if I wanted to play music, I had to find my own group. For all the hard roads and for Robert's own way, the city of Cleveland will be dedicating Robert Lockwood Jr. Way. And I've been here now going on 40 years. Where the hard road meets the river in the flats at the intersection of St. Clair and Old River Bend Road, where Old Shorty's is, will now be the Robert Lockwood Jr. Way. Thank you very much. Well, it was pretty nice. I got a street named after me. Yeah. I never will forget this day. I was asked one time by uh, Bob Dylan and about, uh, just think of the name of that song, Steady Rolling Man. And he asked me, would I show him? And we went through a little thing, but I showed him. Well, after I got through showing him, he couldn't do it. Then he asked me if I would show his guitar player. And I told him about how much nerve he had, but I told him to go get him, and I showed him, and he couldn't do it. 
And I knew he couldn't do it when I showed him. Yeah. So what Robert had was very special. And the, the coordination to play and sing and back up yourself and all that is hard to do. Yeah. I'm a steady rolling man. And I roll both night and day. I'm a steady rolling man. I roll both night and day. Sweet woman to be rolling this way. Thank you. But that's the, the best thing ever happened to me, though, was he came along. Yeah. Johnny Shines, Robert Jr. Lockwood. Sonny Boy Williamson, Honey Boy Edwards, Calvin Frazier, Sonny Land Slim, Baby Boy Warren, Elmore James, I'm sure you can add to the list. None of them were memorializing the music of Robert Johnson when they sang songs that echoed his style or even performed his signature compositions. Each of them was making music that moved them. They were singing songs that continued to live on in their own terms, whether or not their audience, or in some cases even the singer himself, knew of Robert Johnson or even recognized his name. I followed to the station With a suitcase and a hand I followed it down to the station With a suitcase and a hand You know I was so blue And I was so lonely With all my love in vain All my love in vain And of course as their music grew in popularity As it fanned out in ever-widening arcs It reached people who would be newly moved by its power And newly moved to create music of their own And the train Rolled into the station And I looked her in the eye Oh yeah You know the train Rolled into the station oh. I looked her straight in the eye Didn't like what I saw either You know I felt so lonesome I felt so lonesome all I could do was cry All my love's in vain And the train Left the station There was two lights on behind Well, you know, the train left the station You know the blue light, it was my blues The red light, it was my mind All oh, my love's in vain Hey, hey Ooh, Miss Betty, man Some months ago, 
allegedly there was found a short piece of film footage that purportedly showed Robert Johnson on film. And uh, this particular piece of film, this archival piece of film, was something that stirred, to say the least, the emotions and the curiosity and the interest of blue scholars all around the world. There had been a lot of rumor about this particular piece of film. There had been a lot of speculation about it. There had been a lot of excitement about it. Okay? Steve, if you would take over. Sure. Um, a Memphis shopkeeper named uh, Leo Taterred Allred uh, is the person that brought this film to everyone's attention. And he did it in such a way that uh, it cast a great deal of mystery upon who it was and where it came from. Uh, he reported that the original film no longer existed, um, uh, that he had a snippet on video, and uh, he wouldn't show it to me and never did show it to me. I had to find this film on, on my own. Um, uh, but I was very curious about it, representing the estate of Robert Johnson. Quite naturally, if it was Robert Johnson, I wanted to know about it. My grandmother ran, ran this theater that Mr. Jackson had here, Mr. Bim Jackson. The way this film came about was some friends of mine bought the theater back in the, I guess, the early 70s, and they ran it. And they opened the canisters, uh, the Duras from, from Ruval. Uh, some of you guys may know them. And uh, supposedly spliced them together. Some of them died as they opened them up, and they spliced a lot of them together. This all, later on in this footage, there were football highlights. It was just stuff sh that was shot in Ruval, Mississippi hmm. for, for many years. But there were all kinds of stuff. Then it was donated to the University of Mississippi. From there, I just took it up and took a feel, you know, took a steal of it. And we started looking at it. Everybody, you know, everybody has their own idea who it might be. But uh, obviously no one knows for sure. You, you showed it to Jimmy Page and Robert Plant because I think they were quoted in the London Times article that I mentioned before regarding this. What, what did they think of it? I'm just uh, curious. They were very amazed at the finger work uh, of the guitar work on them. There was, there's been a lot of folks who have seen it. I've, I offered to show it to anybody who wanted to look at it. I never could see it and didn't see it until a friend of mine in the Mississippi Delta uh, offered me the true story behind this film. It was taken, uh, or uh, sponsored at least, by a man who owned a theater in Ruleville, Mississippi, and took this film to be able to show back to his audience uh, whenever they happened to come to the theater. You go to w watch a movie of your choice, and between uh, films, if it were a double feature or whatever, uh, you could watch yourself on screen. And he made a colored hometown movie, and he made a white hometown movie. Depending upon the audience that he had in the theater that day, that's the film he'd show. And so people were encouraged to come and have a look at this film and see themselves on screen. And that's how this came about. That was a typical Friday, Saturday night in Ruval, Mississippi, all the way up until, say, uh, early 70s. Uh, Mr. Jackson... Mr. Jackson shot a lot of the film footage. My grandmother shot a lot of the film footage. Uh, other people there shot the film footage. It was, just, it was just a small country town that, you know, he was fortunate enough to have a camera and he shared, you know, went out and tried to capture what was there in the city at that time. The big question, of course, who is that guy? That's what we want to know. It's remarkable footage, whoever it is, because we don't have footage of Delta Blues men performing from anything remotely like that early, plus we have amazing footage of the street in Ruleville, a busy street scene from Saturday afternoon. What you see that shows it was from 1942 is a movie poster for a movie that came out in December of 41. This is the film Blues in the Night that um, is in the background you'll see in a moment if you notice the two stills. And the individual that shot the film was the man on the right there. Look at the yellow frame up on the left. <coughs> and then the yellow frame in the center. And then it'll show them together. See, up in the left, and then together you can see that the stills are the same, and it's the same movie that was released in December of 41. I went to Ruleville and researched Twin Blues in the Night, uh, played at the Delta Theater, and it was January 29th and 30th, 1942. Uh, that's Friday and Saturday, and uh, Friday being a working day, uh, this is obviously not a working day for these people, and so this is a film from January 30th, 1942. Johnson died August 16th, 1938. 
Any idea who this could be? Any? None whatsoever. Robert Lockwood is in the audience. Robert, any ideas? Well, what I've seen don't look like Robert to me. Does the musician look like anyone you would know? No. Elmore James? Well, I knew Elmore James very good. So does that look like him? No. You playing the guitar? No. <laughs> no. I had to ask you. <laughs> it was told to me that you had seen this film earlier and that you mm -hmm. thought it was and that mm -hmm. Honey Boy thought it was and mm -hmm. a few other musicians. Are you telling me told you a lie? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have another very distinguished bluesman in here. I think Henry Townsend is here. Is that right? Maybe we can hear it. Henry, do you want to comment on this film? Do you need to say anything about... It's not, it's not, I mean, it's same as Robert Lockwood. It is not Robert Johnson. Okay. My philosophy all along has been, is it is or is it ain't, I don't know. You guys will know. The devil is the only one that maybe knows for sure, you know? It is, of course, not Robert Johnson. Uh, but it does look like Robert Johnson in certain ways. Robert Lockwood last night said... I don't care how many times you look at this film, it ain't never going to be Robert Johnson. <laughs> so that's the final word on the subject as far as uh, I'm, I'm concerned. Well, I just got here, so I didn't get to hear all the other great groups, so we're going to have some fun now.
Thank you. It's Steve Levere, Mr. Coffee. The fellow that called you. Yes, sir. How you doing? Well, I'm doing pretty good. How you doing? I'm doing all right today. Let me show you these school records that I found down in Tunica in the courthouse. They're from the Indian Creek School. Right. And it mentions your name here. It lists your name, Willie Coffee, Leon Coffee as your father. And also on the back here in, in the pages, it lists Robert Spencer at age 14 and you were age 9. Now, they didn't call him Robert Spencer on the records, as you know. No, they called him Robert Johnson. Mm -hmm. See, there's one of them right there. Yeah. And last fair deal gone down. Yeah, that's one of them old big records, ain't it? Yeah, sure is. Mm -hmm. Me and him, we, and lots more us boys, we played hooky and get up under the church and had a little stand up there. We get up under and had some boards and we get up under and he blow his harp and pick his old juice harp for us and sing under there. Uh-huh. We play hooky until the teacher would find out right out there and she'd make us come in and give us five lashes for playing hooky. Blowing harp and blowing juice harp. That's right, it. Nobody was playing guitars yet in those days, no, is that right? He, either one of us wasn't playing guitar in those days. But later years, he started before I did, and then he showed me a lot about playing the guitar. Can you demonstrate to me what, what he tried yeah, to show he you? On, he put on a slide. He, he made him a slide out of a bottleneck. Mm -hmm. A piece of old brass or anything that would fit his finger right tight. And mostly he put it on his little finger. And he would always start off like this. All he wanted to do was to hear you play something one time. And he could play. He had your lick, huh? He had your collect. That's when I think he was, to my eye, in my days and his days, he was the greatest. And I feel so lonesome. You hear me weeping, my. And I feel so lonesome You hear me weep and moan You've been driving my tablet now For you since I've been gone Sit I bless my lights, my mom This horn won't even blow Even flow my lies, mama, this harm won't even blow. Well, there's a show in the connection where well, babes way down below. I'm gonna waste your hood, mama. I'm bound to check your oil. I got a woman that I'm loving way down in Arkansas. Well, you know the cars ain't even buzzing. Generator won't get the spark. It's all in a bad condition. You gotta have these batteries charged. I'm crying, please. Woo Don't do me wrong. You've been driving my tablet now for you since I've been gone. Did he have any nicknames around here? People call him for short names? Not as I know. Though. We never know nothing but Robert Dusty and Robert Smith. That's all I ever know. Though. Turn that over and you'll see the dude. Ah, that's really him then, there. That's really him. What's that? We had old Jip, like we call old plantation Jip. When Robert walk in there, he jump up. Just like the president didn't come in. 
Is that right? Yeah, they jump up. Getting ready to dance. Man, he could tear them up. He'd knock dust out of the flow. Break the flow in, shouting and jumping. Is that right? Yeah, he's just that good. A few minutes ago, you were telling me about the Jenks Blues and how, how yeah. Willie Brown and Robert Johnson would pop the strings yeah. when they played that. Go ahead, keep that going. That sounds pretty good. Well, see, that's my trouble. <laughs> I, got to, I got to get back to it, but you see. Okay. Now, Robert, he had a knack. He'd do it this way. See, I never could get that right. I had to get on that string like this. You know. But he could slap it like this. Tom hit this string and the long finger hit this part of the box. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you see Charlie Patton play that same song? Yeah, I see Charlie Patton do it. He'd throw it all up and catch it. <laughs> Is that right? And do it, but I never could do that. But I learned it the way I learned it, mm -hmm. like Woody Brown and Son Alpha do it. They, Pop the thing like that. Now hitting the guitar and and hitting it with his with his finger and his thumb at the same time is is that kind of like the same way Charlie Patton would do? Yeah, that's the same way uh -huh. Charlie Patton would do. But Robert, he was my main friend. He always told me, he said, "Now you gonna stay in plot these old long head mules until you die, rather than give up and follow me." So if you follow me, you won't know nothing about them mules no more. Won't care anything about them. But I never did follow him no way. How come? Yeah, I just didn't have the nerve. I see. He traveled like him. He traveled all over the state, I reckon. He could tell me some places I can't think of now where he went to. Yeah. And you two stayed in touch over the years, did you? Oh, when he come back to his home down there in a Mississippi down there, he, he would come visit us up here two or three times a year or more. I'm going to get up in the morning, I believe I'll dust my broom. I'm going to get up in the morning, I believe I'll dust my broom.
fellas. Gail Dean Wardlow argues that Hell Hunt on My Trail was a kind of afterthought because Robert did not record it until the second day of his last 1937 session. But if it was, this is merely one more example of Johnson's genius. However it was composed, whether Johnson ever performed it in public or not, it is unforgettably chilling in a way that only the greatest art can be. And this is a quote from Rudy Blesch. The notes paint a dark wasteland, starless, ululant with bitter wind, swept by the chill rain. Over a hilltop trudges a lonely, ragged, bedeviled figure. I gotta keep moving. Well, I'll keep moving. Blues falling down the hill. Blues falling down. I gotta keep on moving. Blues falling down the hill. All in the day, been a mind of me. There's a hellhound on my trail. Hellhound on my trail. If the day was Christmas Eve, if the day was Christmas Eve, the tomorrow was a Christmas day. Today was Christmas Eve, people. <laughs> Tomorrow was Christmas Day. Oh Lord, wouldn't we have a time? <laughs> All I need is my sweet little rider and I pass the time away. Pass the time away. Hot foot powder mm, all around my door. All around your daddy's door. The sprinkle hot foot powder mm, all around your daddy's door. And I wrap them high rider mm. Every old place that I go <laughs> Every old place I go Every old place I go <laughs> Now I can tell the wind is rising The leaves are trembling Leaves trembling on them trees But leaves are trailing on their tray. All I need is my little woman now. Keep my company. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sandhouse said, we'd all play for the Saturday night balls and there'd be this little boy standing around. And when we'd get a break and want to rest some, we'd set the guitars up in a corner and go out in the cool. Well, Robert would watch and see which way we'd gone and he would pick up one of the guitars and such another racket you never heard. It'd make the people mad, you know. Then Robert went away for a time, and when he came back, he showed up at a little juke joint house was playing outside of, Robin outside of Robinsonville. But Robert was gone then. 
Rob was naturally gone a while with that guitar. And man, he was so good. When he finished, all our mouths were standing open. I said, well, ain't that fast. He's gone now. Uh, he got up that way so quick, I don't know. But he say he sold himself to, sold to the devil. A story grew up that Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads at midnight in order to become a master of the blues. And, uh, and that he did. He became a master of the blues, recorded some of the greatest blues ever, and died shortly thereafter. So I think he got the short end of the deal if he did make a deal. Um, but that's been an ongoing uh, controversy am among blues scholars and fans, you know, whether anything like that really happened or whether that was just, uh, just a figurative uh, selling your soul to the devil because the blues has always been known as the devil's music and anyone who played it was in league with the devil. It didn't mean that you'd actually gone to the crossroads and actually met a figure who made a deal with you in blood or anything. But I think a lot of people do believe that, or they like to believe it. People are looking for a, for a fantastic myth. People are making a lot of money all off of these rumors, you know. But I don't, I just can't figure it out. When Robert told you that he had sold his soul to the devil, did you think he was being serious? No, I never did think he was serious because he had always, he come in here with us. He always come in, you know, with a lot of jive. And, and, you know, joking, cracking a lot of jokes like that. And uh, I never did believe in it. We are merely witnessing a natural and a very human need to explain the inexplicable. To say that Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil is to pay him the highest compliment we can pay any artist, which is to say that his art defies explanation. It rises above its surroundings. <laughs>
you very much. We appreciate it. We're Government Mule. From the late 80s through earlier this year, for about 11 years, I lived in the Mississippi Delta and had a record store there. And uh, I can't tell you how many people came through looking for Robert Johnson. Uh, not, not for Robert Johnson, but for his grave or for the actual site of the crossroads where he sold his soul to the devil. And my brother-in-law worked at the store and he got so sick of it that he finally made this sign up. Do not ask where the crossroads are, but people would still ask. And I kind of played along with the game. I wrote an article about it and I did a map of seven or eight different crossroads. And, and uh, one team came down from Chicago. They were, uh, they were doing parapsychological research and they claimed they could, uh, I, it was all a joke, I guess, but they claimed they could uh, take soil samples from each crossroad and, and by determining the weight of a soul, the one that had the, that weight missing from the sample would be the one where the crossroads deal was made. Well, I was About his standing at the crossroad trying to flag a ride and everybody kept a passing by. Mm -hmm. Nobody didn't stop. So where do you think the crossroads was? I think that was the crossroad to eternity. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think about it. I think it's the crossroad, crossroad to eternity. Uh, you don't put any stock in it being at 49 and 61, do you? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> Sun going down. Dark gonna catch me in. Sun going down. Dark gonna catch me in. Nobody knows. In them days, if you could make any music, anything, is what we call old jokes, you know, uh, the women would follow you. An old one to chase him. A woman chasing Robert? They chased him. <laughs> Tell me about it. Now, she, she's a woman that they call a Lucille. And she chased him one day on the road. He's going out to his mama's them. I don't know where he had been, but he come in. And he'd been kind of shanking around with her, you know. And somehow or another, they got into it. And she chased him right across the ditch from one side, across the ditch to the other side, and back and forth. He jumped the ditch. She'd go around to the bridge and come back. Whoop, he'd jump back across on that side until somebody from Conway's come along in an old T model. Rolled the top off her just about and picked him up and carried him on out to his mama. She swore she was going to kill him. She had an ice pick at Robertson trying to starve him. Yeah. 
Now they were running back and forth across this ditch. Back and forth. Was she threatening him? Yes, she was threatening him. Yeah, we'll see him chase him all across that field. Is she still living? Well, she got killed after the end. She got killed at the joke house. Had we not had our invitations lost to the Robert Johnson tribute, we would probably have like jumped right in on this wonderful, beautiful song. And since we are so close right now to the crossroads of 61 and 49, right there, this is really appropriate, I think. Very appropriate to do this. You better come on in my kitchen. It's going to be raining outdoors. Man that I love, it stole from my best friend. That joker got lucky, stole him back again. You better come on in my kitchen. It's going to be raining outdoors. Now he's gone, he won't come back I took the last nickel from his union sack You better come on in my kitchen It's going to be raining outdoors When a woman gets in trouble, everybody put her down Looking for a good friend that can't be found. You better come on in my kitchen. It's going to be raining outdoors. Well, the main point to me about Robert Johnson is the fact that he's such a fascinating combination of uh, not only technique but feeling and technique that takes the music to just higher ground period and the way he does that is in a totally unique way if you look at the other players uh, of that time period he just head and shoulders is above them how does that translate in terms of guitar technique you know his rhythmic sense I think is key if, if he for example when he does a lick he'll, he'll go you, you'll still hear the the flavor of the of the uh, of the beat, but he'll he'll like put it behind or in front of. He'll go. See, I mean, that's you feel how it's like it's got tension to it. Yeah. tension to the music that I think gives it a lot more power than it would otherwise And there's have. a lot more dynamics also in, in of course. terms of volume. You know, because I think the other part, the dynamics, is that what I tell people is, is a lot of people approach slide guitar as a very singular thing. Okay, now I'm going to take a solo. Now I'm playing slide. Robert Johnson completely includes slide in his rhythmic sense. And that's what I like personally. And I... I stylistically and have 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 really drawn on that for example let me illustrate he'll do he'll do so he's using the slide in the rhythm i mean it's like incorporated it's not like solo time so that's a big difference yeah. a lot of people did not do that you still had the call and response and the answer back and the verses and so forth and, and other players but not the not the intricate way he did it where do you think he got that from 
Boy, God knows. I have no idea. I, I there, to me, uh, you can hear a little bit of that probably in in Charlie Patton. I think historically, but uh, I think it's all his own. I think he was the new kid on the block. He was blazing a new trail. when Robert died? I don't recollect really what Martin and Daisy was, but he was up in the, up in the summertime. Mm-hmm. Up in the summertime. It was 1938. 38. Well, a lot of people off of out there where he was raised went to his funeral, but I wasn't able to go because I had got burnt out. And to tell you the fact, I didn't have nothing to wear. Mm-hmm. I didn't have nothing to wear down there. I got burnt out and got left with something on just like, oh, it wasn't good as what me and you got on now. All I learned in his death is he say he had the pneumonia. Mm-hmm. So that's all, I, that's all I could get out of it. Is that what people said around here when he died? That's what they usually got to come with in Robertson then. He died of pneumonia. He died of pneumonia. I believe the story of his death that he was poisoned at a juke joint near Greenwood uh, called Three Forks. Um, I believe that's the, the correct story. This is Robert's certificate of death from the state of Mississippi. Now on the back of this death certificate it says that the plantation owner who owned the property where Robert died, it was his opinion that Robert died of syphilis. What do you think about that? Well, uh... I ain't gonna dispute that he could have died with that, not pneumonia like they said, but that was a private part if he died with that, you know, the people thought it was a disgrace. As famous as he was for to die with some kind of complaint mm -hmm. like that. Now that's, that's my opinion about that. Sure. Yeah, that's, but that's the talk we heard here that he died of. Pneumonia. No one knows anything really for sure about Robert Johnson. They don't, it, it seems like, you know, they don't know how, really how he died, who killed him, where he's buried, where his body is. 
and there are two separate graves uh, marked in Mississippi within a couple of miles of each other. In the immediate aftermath of Robert Johnson's death, before it was even known that he was dead, John Hammond advertised his appearance at the December 23, 1938 Spirituals to Swing concert at Carnegie Hall, which was called an evening of American Negro music, and it was dedicated to the memory of Bessie Smith. When Hammond found out that Johnson was dead, he read a brief elegy to, to him and played recordings of walking blues and preaching blues from the stage. Woke up this morning, felt around for my shoes. Baby, I know I had them all. Oh, walking blues, oh. Up this morning, look around, felt around for my shoes. Oh, baby, I knew I had them on me no walking blue. Well, I feel most like one of my own, almost them hard. Woke up this morning, my little bird flown, I won't leave. Be my own lonesome home. Woke up this morning, my little bird flown.
Robert died, I, I didn't want to see him dead, so I didn't go that way. And uh, for a while, I was uh, chasing myself. Like I would be here this week, and I'd leave, and I'd go someplace, and I'd run into somebody. Somebody would say, oh, I saw, Rob, I saw, I saw Robert, Robert Johnson in Cleveland. And I went back because I thought maybe he wasn't gone, you know, and it would be me that they saw. Which ones do you remember being the most popular of, of his songs? Well, the most popular one he had that I like it was, Hey, baby, don't you want to go? Now, whenever he come in, that's what I wanted to play for me. Baby, don't you want to go with me to the land of California, my sweet home in Chicago? Man, that nigga. Break <laughs> tears from ya. I hate to talk about it. I hate to talk about it. He can raise a family. That, that was definitely his song, wasn't it? That was definitely mine, too. He could sing that. Now, that was his famous song with me. I just, when the women said, Give me a quarter, give me a dime. I want to play a couple of records. I said, what you going to I'm going to play Rob. I said, you going to play Sweet Home in Chicago? Yeah, I'm going to play that. I said, all right. I give her a quarter. And then that's what you want to hear. That's huh? what I want to hear. Man, yeah. That was my old buddy. Well, what about Terraplane? Everybody loved Terraplane. Yeah, Terraplane is all right, but that Sweet Home in Chicago. Man. Come on in my kitchen, it's going to be raining, I don't. Man, them was my two records he made, I was crazy about. I just really love them. That's wonderful. I hate to talk about him too much. Yeah, I understand. Thank you all again, ladies and gentlemen. I didn't think I'd live that long.
to my sweet home, Chicago. Thank you. Honey Boy Edward, Henry Townsend, Robert Lockwood. Come on. Yeah. Well, Robert Johnson really can't die because I'm here. Robert Johnson's blues, like any art that moves us, should be taken as a beginning, not an end, an inspiration, not a public monument. As Johnny Shines never tired of pointing out, you have to build your house on a solid foundation. If you forget your beginnings, you can't do much with the future. At the same time as Johnny was equally quick to remind his listeners, you can't honor the past without embracing the present. And it's hard to tell, it's hard to tell When all your love's in vain All my love's in vain Station. Yeah, with two lights on behind. The train left the station. With two lights on behind. And a blue light was my blue. And the red light was my mind With all my love's in vain mm -hmm. Thank you very much, rock and roll. Peace out to Cleveland. Thank you very much. Stay tuned for more great music. <laughs>